at uh, computer says 616. First item is roll call. Uh, Legislative Committee Member Thay Kubishak. Legislative Committee Member Steve Cove. Uh, Shane Blazer, <coughs> Chairperson. Uh, let's start with Sue. Sue Jones, City Attorney. Tyler Mitz, and Ike. Andy Reddick, Community Media. Dennis Pollock, Citizen. Heather Cove, Citizen. Furman Blood, his Chief of Police. Zach Brewing, Mayor. Sounds good, thank you. First item uh, on our agenda is review and consider for adoption an amendment to the well abatement ordinance moving the program to Waterworks and Lighting Commission. I'll just mention Water and Light. I did speak with Jem um, to make them aware that this meeting was happening and they, they saw the agenda and were aware of it. And um, they didn't have any further comment than that at this time. Um, since Adam was previously communicating to the group about this, I think there were memos and that prepared and probably reviewed them. The department is interested because they're moving into 2020 cycle for permit review and wanting to plan their workload and uh, of course given the amount of activity com commercial activity and, and industrial inspection and such you know their workload planning their workload just impacts what they're planning on uh, you know, kind of the ability to keep up with inspections as well as um, uh, fill, fill the obligations that we have with Port Edwards and the other inspection jurisdictions that we work with so uh, that's the big question I guess that's time sensitive now um, from when it was last discussed in last fall or last or the last legislative meeting was held. Committee? I make a motion to um, move the well abatement ordinance to the water works and the commission. We have a motion. The the only a, a, I guess the motion on the floor. Um, the only thing that I've got a concern about is we don't have a uh, a plan, uh, planning director, economics director, whatever you want to, whatever the terminology is of what we're looking for. So I would like to, and I know time is of the essence, but I'd like to find out what, if maybe they want to keep it in house for certain reasons. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about this. So what would, what would you like to know about it? I mean, it's pretty, I mean, I can help explain more about it. If, please. What, if you have any questions oh. about it. Yeah, please explain. Well, what? Well, it's I, to me, it's pretty self-explanatory. What? What questions do you? What do you need more to know more about? I guess I don't even know the questions to ask to want to know what answers I'd be seeing. So maybe I'll just elaborate on the program. So basically, DNR code requires municipalities that have a water system to inspect and issue permits on a five-year rotation if you have a non, if you have a well, a private well somewhere on your property for sprinkling, for whatever purpose. And essentially, the, the, it's an unfunded mandate by the DNR to require us to make sure there's not cross-contamination into the water system. Well, the benefit is not necessarily to the city, but to the water utility to prevent backfill or backflow uh, and that sort of thing into the uh, water system or distribution system. So in Adam's review, um, there were, I think, a dozen municipalities that were reviewed, and the lion's share of them have their water departments do the inspection, because the water department's already doing inspections on the, the meter and the connections in the home. So the customer service issue is <coughs> residents are required to go get a sample of their water to water and light. They, pull the, they fill out a permit application with the city here at City Hall. Um, the city hall has to connect with them on the water results, and then we have to send our inspector out. Well, around the same time, Water and Light's also doing some form of inspection of their own with their inspector. So the homeowners are seeing two inspections, two inspectors, and then there's this there's this lack of response we get from residents because there's this belief that oh well we just had our water inspected or we just had our connections inspected. Well, no, they're two separate things. One's a private well situation, one's a water distribution system issue. And I don't know the history of why it was ever done this way. I think we had a water inspector maybe or a, a plumbing inspector that for whatever reason workload distribution happened that we did that and Water and Light continues to do all of their water inspection. But the li why the lion's share of municipalities do this is because of the customer service benefit and the fact that the utility is responsible for maintaining the water system. The city proper is not to we, we delegate that authority. Now, if you recall from the memo, there is a financial, um, you know, 
income stream associated with it, but it far um, it does not cover the cost of the inspections. I mean, yeah, we've got staff, and we don't we're not going to reduce staff as a result. But I can tell you, we're probably not going to contract out for certain inspections if we can bring them in house. You know, like the commercial inspection and, and some of the others. Um, so we've got enough work to do to fill the backload of the time that's spent, not to mention the administrative time that's associated with sending the permit, setting up, you know, there's like five or six reminders that people get sometimes before we can even get them to respond. Um, so that's trying to give you a sense of what's that program look like, and that's, I think, the issue uh, with the program is it's, it's not common for cities, it's more common for the water utility, and frankly, it's a customer service thing to residents uh, to not have to make two trips and, and then work with different inspectors and coordinate those inspections. So if this is a benefit to the utility, did the utility request this? I guess I don't understand. It's not a benefit, it's an obligation by the state. It's a mandate that the city and whoever does it, it's up to the city to decide. Um, the does program the benefits the utility right. because it's protecting their water source. It has nothing to do with the city. Any city assets, it's it's the municipal it's the utilities. Well, yeah, it's the utilities protecting their water supply. Right. So So we're looking out for the utility then. <laughs> well we have to look out well, for the well, utility, right? I think that's who the, should pay for it? The ratepayers of the Waterworks and Lightning Commission, uh, or Waterworks uh, that utility, um, who you know their rate ratepayers pay for everything re water related and I think it makes sense that then they pay for the protection of the water supply, those ratepayers, versus only the city taxpayers on the general levy are paying for a service which protects the utilities, uh, purports to protect the utilities' water. So I'm just saying they're they're receiving the benefit of us of us doing it or it being done basically. It's to protect their water supply. I remember when this. Came, this mandate came about personally because I had a well in my basement and at that time the first first go around was you had to get rid of it so I had a plumber come in and do all the proper procedures to get rid of it and then it came about well if you have one already this is an opportunity for you to be able to keep it but you have to jump through these hoops and um, yeah I agree that that's for the protection of water and light and maybe that's a responsibility or administrative responsibility that they can take on and and overseas since it is for the protection of their water or our water but it's for the protection of their system which they're responsible for the only the reason why I bring it up though is because I had made and I think it was me I had made a suggestion at a committee meeting about reducing responsibility for certain job posting and Mr. Goth I had gotten a very strong email in response from you saying that we shouldn't be looking at changing anything if we're looking at it, 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 uh, uh, attracting talent and maybe that person is watching right now and says well you know I wanted to do that I'm a plan director or whatever that I'm either interested in applying or already has applied and now they're going to pull their name out with for the exact reasons that you sent me in the email how many we there's a lot of them that we do there's well and we we can only do so many a year so right, that's why they're on a five-year rotation right yeah. yeah yeah I thought there was there's I think it's 1200 well, 1200 yeah, 1200 wide. 400 300 years And I think you know, there's also a component to this, and I won't get into the, somebody wanting to maybe do this work. I think the utility outsources, um, I'm fairly confident the utility outsources their inspection services yeah. now. Yeah, um, know somebody. yeah, and so it'd be more of just like an added scope to their work. And they'll get, the, of course, the revenue. The, it's a $50, I think, permit every five years. Um, so they can you know, achieve the revenue to offset that cost. But as it relates to the, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh. Um, Inspection. I mean, I think there's, we can all agree that there's more neighborhood inspections that should occur in certain properties that occur, right? Whether it's code enforcement, whether it's property maintenance, and I think you hear from your residents in your districts about that, and um, so this is another opportunity to, to, I believe, perform more inspections to, to ensure code compliance as it relates to health, safety, welfare of certain structures in town. And if it's come, it, Comes the decision by the council to institute a, a, a 
tenant occupied inspection program at some point in the future. This will free up that time to, to accomplish that. So we do have a motion on the floor by uh, Mr. Cole to adopt him or to adopt an amendment on the well or the abandonment ordinance and moving it to Waterworks Mining Commission. And I'll second that motion. So we have a motion and a second to, I guess anybody else have anything they want to add? I haven't heard from Water and Light at all. I, I, either you gentlemen have? I haven't got any communication. Yeah, I haven't had any communication either. Just um, if we do get another uh, economic developer and they, they want to take this back in house, we would have that option to talk with Water and Light, bring it back in house in one week. Uh, I don't think so. I think once it's gone, it's gone. I think they'll be happy that it's gone. <laughs> but I can't speak for them. So we have a motion and a second to move the, the program over to Water and Light Commission. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So we have two ayes and one nay. Motion carries. Uh, third item, review and discuss policies relating to the taping and broadcast of city meetings. Speaking of, I think your audio just cut out again. <laughs> Somebody just said it. Speaking of that, I think Tyler and Andy, if we get their audio back, I'll be right back. You, uh, <laughs> take a moment here. Okay. It went down and it's back up again. Okay. All right. I kind of hear. At least audio. All right. So Tyler, Andy. Yeah, I, I sent. Uh, I sent you three an email with the the policy. It just kind of covers, um, you know, what the what we are recording, what we have found to be which community our committees we are recording, um, and then kind of the retention power um, period of of these recordings, um, and then you know uh, if certain instances come up, what what the what the guidelines are. For, for that, so anything uh, that isn't um, a standing meeting that we are recording, you know, we have a workflow that they can be requested to me and then whatever, uh, pending resources and availability, we would then record that meeting. Um, nothing, nothing really wild, um, just kind of putting forth the policy. And this is a policy that you would typically find at other municipalities uh, very similarly uh, uh, worded. Um, so, um, you know, basically a standard uh, um, outlining which uh, meetings are covered and um, and all of the mechanics of coverage of turnaround time and so forth. Um, I did read this policy today. I do have a couple questions. Okay. What, um, where was it? So a health, meetings held in facilities that with live capabilities. So if a uh, first floor conference room is booked and we have to go to the third floor conference room, there will be no taping. Is that what you're saying? I, I believe we would be able to tape, but not be able to broadcast live if that's, oh, correct. If that's the correct assumption. So we, 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 have our, we have Facebook Live, like this yep. meeting and all the other, the Common Council and uh, all the other. Because I don't think so. that is addressed in here. Oh, OK that it would still be taped and then aired. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to see that in there. Okay. And then who is, or what is the position of Director of Technology? Uh, yeah. I've never heard of this position. Right. Um, well, yeah, that would be the predecessor of me. Um, my official title is the IT manager, um, but uh, it could be could be me as well. I, I'm kind of overseeing the community department and the IT department currently. Um, so I could change that to myself. Um, I think we should have it uh, in a position that it, we actually have. Okay. And so a, a position that we don't have. Okay. And nor are we currently filling that, I do believe. Uh, unless we need to take it up at another HR agenda meeting uh, regarding that position, if we need to eliminate it once and for all. Um, but yeah, I think we should have, have a a okay. person or if that put your title in there if that's who the mayor designates as sure. as a person that oversees this decision okay 
Committee? Yeah, I got one real quick. Tyler, what does, um, what's the, the intent, uh, your third paragraph, where it states uh, Wisconsin Rapids Community Media, media of all local meetings will be retained for one calendar year from the date of the meeting. What is the intent on putting language one calendar year in there? We're just keeping the physical copy and we're keeping the, the copy on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page for one calendar year. We're actually keeping on our YouTube page probably longer than that, but that's just the framework of how long we're going to keep the recordings and the physical copy as well. Because so. with YouTube, um, I can see if YouTube went out of, <laughs> YouTube's never going to go out of business. Yeah. Um, but I have utilized meetings or went back and, and found information on meetings on YouTube that were beneficial for everybody um, that were more than one calendar year. I don't want this to somehow be now a exclusivity to one year and then somehow after 365 days that it now gets removed from YouTube because it's identifying on here that this video recording is not considered the official recording. Therefore, after 365 days, someone can say, well, the policy says um, this is not the official record, so you're going to have to go to the clerk's office and find the printed minutes and use those as the official. You know, that's where I've got a, a, a problem with it. Once it's recorded, now, and that's where I kind of allude to with if YouTube goes out of business, we can't recreate documents if a third party goes out of business and we lose it that way. Um, but uh, even though these are not, even the electronic files are not necessarily official documents, if they're um, uh, uh, records, um, we need to keep them for perpetuity, you know, regardless if it's an email or if it's a, a video or anything else. If we lose it and we can't provide it, that's one thing, but we should not be in the business of destroying anything. Even if it costs money to, to put it on CDs. I mean, if, if we run out of, uh, like, no one has a CD player anymore, a DVD player anymore, you know, that might be more plausible um, than we can't. We can't produce it, but to destroy something, I don't, that's scary. That that goes down a slippery slope. Sure, so. yeah, I don't think the intention was to say that we will destroy it after one calendar year. I think the intention was saying, you know, hey, but we'll clear we'll clear it up. Yeah, it's not clear. Um, I'll clear it up and I'll, I'll resend it. So. And I know some of that is a holdover from back in the day when yeah. all of these recordings were on tapes. Right. And the physical space to be able to store all of that caused policies such as this but our intention as we post everything to YouTube isn't to go back and say well that one's over a year we pull it no we the intention is to keep it all there go to Best Buy and ask them for a VCR see what they say you know I mean it's going the way of the dodo bird a lot of record players are coming back so what's a record player <laughs> exactly all right uh, yeah I think just a couple changes and if uh, you guys want to or if you want to those and have it ready for council, and we can take care of it right away then. And sure. Dispose of it if that works. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yep. Does it beg the question around just our records retention policies? And then we've been here now for a little bit of time, and I know not a lot of that stuff has changed. Well, right. And the, the records retention policies actually for audio tapes and video tapes of meetings is if is really their their uh, their use in making the minutes and then they can be destroyed 90 days after the minutes are done so um, you know but I guess and and certain records like minutes have are in per perpetuity but the vast majority of other documents are seven years you know event plus seven years or the you know whenever whatever the record might be so um, I mean I think we've, we've talked about that and and you know making sure that we are retaining the records that need to be changed for the the uh, requisite amount of time, but we can, I guess, you know, work on I'm this to make curious. it sound like we're not yep. destroying things necessarily, but yeah. the availability of, of certain information is going to be for a minimum amount of, of time sure. in, in any uh, instance. So, committee, how do you feel about adapting the policy with our recommended changes and sending it to council? 
I don't have a problem. I'll make a motion on that. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adopt the meeting, uh, public meeting guidelines policy uh, with the changes, which you know, Tyler. Yep. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, item four is consider referral from Alder Person Rayom for a study of all committees, commission, boards reg regarding their duties, number of members, whether members are residents of Wisconsin Rapids or not, meeting dates and times. Uh, he did, Mr. Rayom did contact me and asked that we hold over this item until he can attend at our next legislative committee meeting. But Sue has prepared information which we had all received. Um, so it'd be something a good starting point for us to look at and review. Hard copy or electronic? I think it was hard in our mailboxes. Um, hard copy and electronic. Yeah, okay. yep. And electronic? Mm -hmm. I didn't get an email. I don't know if I got one either. I know I've got hard oh, copy here. There's a packet too. Yeah, I guess it was in the packet email. That's what I mean. Oh, okay. Part of the packet. Okay, perfect. I, I see. It wasn't emailed separately. Yeah. But when I put the, the hard copy, had, there was a few typos that I caught, and I wanted to, to date it, so um, I can send that electronically. No, I, hard copy is fine. I haven't yeah. checked my email, but I, in response to getting an email, I did not get an email specifically from you, but I see it in the packet. Right. Yeah, I put it. Sounds good. So I recommend that people uh, take an opportunity to look at that so we're ready to discuss it at a future date. So do we need a motion to postpone it until the next legislative meeting? Sure. Or postpone it to when Mr. Rayom is available? Sure. I'll do that. Uh, I'll make a motion to postpone item number is it four. Four. To the next legislative committee meeting. I'll second. So a motion and a second to postpone item four regarding Mr. Rayom's referral. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item five, consider referral from Alderperson Code relating to increasing fines for disorderly conduct with a motor vehicle, failure to stop at a stop sign, and excessive muffler modified muffler violations. Mr. Code. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, take you guys saw the stuff in the packet. I just have some remarks here. I'm bringing this issue before the legislative committee because in my opinion and the opinion of many other citizens in our city, there is a problem with the number of motorists. These problems are mainly about exhaust, failure to come to a complete stop at stop signs, and behavior that would classify as disorderly conduct with a motor vehicle. Although there are numerous examples of the above mentioned issues, I will share a fair few with you. A young mother who recognized me as a member of city council approached me and told me that how when she was taking her infant child for a walk in the stroller, a truck with a loud exhaust punched down on the accelerator. This caused the vehicle to make a very loud noise and speed off in a residential area. The child was awakened by the event and took several minutes to calm. The mother was concerned for her safety when the vehicle sped up alongside where she was walking because this was an area without a sidewalk like kind of in the Robson Park where you run on the sidewalk by Abercot there. Oh, sure. And she was also concerned about any potential hearing damage she or her child could have suffered from this event. This is not an isolated incident. I have seen or heard of other situations. We want our residents and visitors to our city to be able to enjoy our city. How can people possibly enjoy outside time when there are people who engage in this type of negative behavior? Furthermore, we want people to move to our city. Where is the appeal to live in Wisconsin Rapids when a person who has to work shift work can't sleep because somebody who's going down the road has to announce their presence in the neighborhood via their faulty or modified exhaust system? Loud pipes save lives is not the model here. When a vehicle is manufactured and sold, it is sold with a functioning exhaust system that is street legal. You have the money to go in and get a modified exhaust, and you should probably have the money to start paying a fine for it because this isn't fair to the citizens of our community. This last year, in July, while I was driving on Apricot Street, which had the right-of-way, 
a black pickup truck failed to stop for the stop sign on 16th Street. I had to immediately apply my brakes and miss colliding with the other vehicle by about a foot. The driver of the pickup truck tried to speed away. I did follow that driver and eventually asked him why he failed to stop for the sign. His reply was that he was tired. I told the driver that he was tired and couldn't see the stop sign, then perhaps he should not be driving because this was in an area close to Robinson Park where children are often present. But this also is not an isolated incident. All over the city, people are complaining about drivers who either completely disregard stop signs or do rolling stops. Citizens are now asking for something to be done before something worse happens. As a community leader, I certainly hope that it does not take the death of a child or a fatal car accident before we decide to act. This last year, the city invested money to redo East Grand Avenue. In less than a week's time of the road being open, I noticed somebody decided to break in the road by leaving a skid mark at the intersection of the library. The skid mark was about approximately 20 feet long. This also is not an isolated incident. All throughout the city in various areas, you can find where people for one reason or another decide to put their mark on the road. We as city leaders ask our citizens to fund these roads through special assessments or other tax dollars. So is it fair to the people that are asked to pay for these roads to watch them be destroyed by the negligence of others? And personally, I feel if someone can afford new tires from burning rubber on the road, then they should be able to afford a significant citation for their behavior. I believe we as city leaders owe it to the people we represent to protect their public investment provide an environment that they'll be able to enjoy and ensure their safety to the best of our ability. So how do we fix this? I believe our police department does a fine job enforcing the laws. And I know that they're out there in the community because I see them. I don't think there's a day that passes I don't see two or three patrol cars. But Irm, your guys have a fantastic presence out there. And I'm sure when they see this behavior, they take action to correct it. But I believe we need to do something that will send a message that this type of behavior will not be tolerated in the city of Wisconsin Rapids. So what I'm proposing is anyone with a loud exhaust system is given a five day ticket to correct it. If the exhaust system is not fixed within that time, the violator would receive a $1,000 fine. Number two, as I mentioned in the first case where somebody would intentionally rev a motor with a loud exhaust that it would classify as a disorderly conduct with a motor vehicle. Number three, that anyone who fails to come to a complete stop for a stop sign would receive a $1,000 citation. And number four, anyone who commits disorderly conduct with a motor vehicle would receive a $1,000 citation. Some might view these fines as excessive but I believe that when word gets out into the community of the severity of the fines for poor driving decisions, that there would be a sharp decline in these types of behaviors. I believe we owe it to the citizens of our city who expect us to protect them and their investments that we do something to reduce this kind of behavior. I understand that this isn't a silver bullet that will make all these issues just go away, but I do believe it is a critical first step in the right direction. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just have a, maybe I should say this right at the beginning. Unfortunately, with any traffic uh, violations, those are set by the state. There's a deposit schedule that the judicial conference sets, and we cannot have it different than what right. they do. So that's that's set. So the stop sign and the um, Muffler. The muffler are considered traffic ordinances, so we have to keep our this bond schedule that we have, the, the fine schedule. The disorderly conduct with the motor vehicle, we do have a, an ordinance on that, and that is um, not, I mean, it's arguable whether that's a traffic ordinance or not, but it's not an ordinance that, or it's not a violation that is a state violation. So it's in Chapter 25, which is where our nuisance ordinances and, and those are. So it's arguable that that could be uh, one that we're in control of the deposit schedule on that. But the statute says that the judge sets it and that it's approved by the um, 
the council then any deposit any changes to that deposit so if you want to make a change I'd suggest that that be contact the judge to consider whether he wants to make that change or not um, and the other part of that about the sort of kind of with motor vehicle that's generally a good thing to <laughs> uh, that that's no point so a lot of times you might have these other moving violations and that that is basically what uh, a plea you might plead to that. that that's why that's used a, a lot of times for something like that where you it's not going to be any points and it's just merely a fine um, but it is used in other you know situations as you had mentioned um, with the we're kind of doing something annoying with a vehicle that really doesn't serve serve any purpose so right we we write people for mm -hmm. squealing the tires and popping wheelies on the motorcycle or any of the things mm -hmm. that people do in a vehicle it's just alarms and disturbs another person recently so I uh, sometimes it doesn't specifically state but if you can articulate the, your actions in your car so we do have this ordinance to, to use against folks I've seen it written for people running stop signs in parking lots and things like that where it's, it's not a legal stop sign but it is uh, whether or not it applies or not but it's kind of a but so I, I guess probably then with that information we probably should send a referral to Peter or well if you want to make a recommendation on that you want to change I think that's something that he needs to to basically and I don't know I have one other piece of information okay. for you guys that is not probably not common at the moment I, I the the, uh, the sheriff and I had a conversation not too long ago regarding muni warrants and because of the uh, the size of the inmate population at the jail and the overcrowding situation more than likely the county is going to start charging municipalities a daily rate to, to house prisoners that are held solely on a muni warrant which conceivably this could be so if we've got somebody on a thousand fine schedule be 1300 some dollars for this ordinance and they're sitting in jail well we're on the hook to pay that back to the county to house that prisoner just throwing it out there And they, we, we would pay that till that fines. To that fine, that's, that he'll he'll sit in jail to work off his fine, but we're paying the county to hold that person. So we're pay his fine. Rap is municipal. They set it off at the rate of hundred dollars a day. Is that one? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Rap is rap is municipal is hundred dollars a day. Everything else in the county is fifty dollars a day. When they so in that sense, the taxpayers would pay to house them in jail to pay off their fine. Perfect system. Yeah. I don't want to pay my taxes to go for that but I think though um, but on the other hand when we have these people that are out there doing this they're destroying what our tax dollars are going to build yeah and I, I don't think that anybody's in disagreement with you Steve I mean this is a case where I, I actually today when I was at the gas station we were filling out gas tanks for the job site there was this knothead that came in with some type of um, firecracker exhaust and, and he was revving it and I don't know if he would he was dumping his garbage out into the <laughs> gas station receptacle, not filling up with gas, just dumping out his garbage. And he had it, then he had his music loud, and there were some different stickers in the window. And then as he peeled out, he peeled out of the, the uh, gas station, and then he was at the stop sign, stop light, and then he got a green light and then squealed around doing that. And it was annoying. But the problem is, how without seeing a license plate how do we turn them in you know that's uh, do we need to um, fund the police department more to get more B cops on on the streets you know I'm sure the police <laughs> that. That. <laughs> you know, but that's that's the thing you know is that wow. and again I'm I, I do not condone dumb behavior but um, where is that balance because we could have you know, the 16 squad cars per shift out patrolling, and when people realize, hey, you know, I could get, you know, lighted up here and then given a ticket, but if they knowingly know that, you know, we don't have much money in the budget and we're trying to uh, cut costs here and there, um, people, it, so how, I mean, we could throw resources at this and almost eradicate it, but one can make also an argument murders illegal so making murder illegal should have eradicated murder right oh no, people commit murder every day you know and so it it uh, how do we do it 
is a fine going to do it? I've always been an advocate of like an alternative punishment, like community service, because I, I, I could write a check easy, but doing 20 hours of community service, especially on a weekend and, and when my friends are doing stuff and now I got to do this, you know, and that might make someone realize, but I, it, 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 like you said, there is no silver bullet with this. I mean, how do we actually do that it, it, without spending more resources, patrolling and creating it, it, unintendedly a police state type of a thing with having cameras on every corner to be able to catch everybody doing everything, you know. I don't know, and I don't have an answer to that. But I do applaud your your concern with this, you know. See, I know when I first got on council, one of the biggest things in my district was the semi-trucks coming through the neighborhood. It's like, you could set your watch by and the truck would go by every 30 minutes. And it took some time working with Public Works Department, the street superintendent that we had at the time, and the police department we had at the time, and when we got all set up, and it took time, the police department started patrolling the residential areas, and they started getting the trucks out of the residential areas, and there were some citations issued to what I understand. And word got out in the community, like, hey, if you're not using the truck route, you're gonna get a citation, so use the truck rail, pull around the right way. It worked. I mean, now, six years later, yeah, it, the thing that we did six years ago, it wasn't a silver bullet. Is it 100% effective? No. But has it helped? Yeah, it's like 95% better in the residential areas that you don't have trucks going down. The thought behind this is the same way without turning Wisconsin Rapids into a police state or putting a small battalion of cops in the town. Because I know Berms guys are out there when I go to work at night. Matter of fact, one night I saw three squad cars within one mile of each other on Baker Street that had people pulled over. And you know, I don't know if that was by You guys get the monthly report and you see how many tickets these guys are writing. Yeah, they're, they're doing a great job. And the thing of it is, is maybe now in some cases, maybe the fine isn't enough where people just like, well, if I'm only going to get a $300 fine for doing this, okay, fine, here's the $300. If you do something to put some more teeth into it, where it really hurts, where people think about this, where, where they have a choice of like, well, you know, my tires are down to nothing, maybe I'll just go in and break in East Grand Avenue and leave a 20-foot skid mark on the road. Or if they really think about it, like, well, if I go do this, if I get caught squealing my tires on this road, it's going to cost me a thousand dollars. Maybe it'll deter the behavior. You know, if somebody thinks that they want to play mechanic and drill a bunch of holes in their muffler so it sounds like they're out in the back 40 on the farm when they're going through town, and they realize that there's a harsher negative consequence for that, maybe it'll deter them from doing it. That's that's kind of where I wanted to go with this. Is that if if people start thinking about what the fine is, you know, you reference murder. Yes, it happens. We have a law and you go to prison for a very long time if you kill somebody. But there's still people that do it. But the average everyday person when they get mad, you know, obviously the consequences for your actions should be going through your mind of like, maybe I shouldn't do this. It's not a good idea. But I'm thinking those are the very people that aren't squealing their tires and running stop signs and, and having loud exhausts is that percentage of the population like us that kind of squeeze in and follow the guidelines that are presented before us and then that, uh, that percent of the population that is out there doing that, I don't know how much regard they have for, for laws or, or um, Fines and those type of things, and 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 as, as you worked in jail, you know, there's there's a segment of the population that gladly go take a two weeks and go spend their time in county county jail and pay off the fines, and knowing that that's good enough for them, and they don't care. And that's you know, so then we're paying for those, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to resolve the situation, but I would be in favor of because we like Sue said, we can't do anything about the positive deposit schedule set by the state on mufflers and stop signs, but I think we can reach out to Peter and and see what he's willing to do and then if he's 
willing to make some adjustment on that, then we can we can look at adopting that. And, and I can tell you, even from my time working in the jail, even the people that are there on the municipal warrants, municipal warrants only, they don't want to be there. Um, you, you don't have cable TV. The food isn't the greatest. You only get to eat three times a day, unless you get canteen, which you have to have money to do. I mean, it's not exactly a holiday for them, and when they get there, they don't want to be there. They want out. And I would further argue that a lot of these people are doing this stuff, but they don't have the money. They're not the people that are investing in our community. They have no vested interest in our community. They probably don't own property here. They probably don't even rent here. They probably fall in the category of people that are transient, where they just crash here for a while, crash here for a while, and just go from place to place doing their thing. And maybe it not, might not be a very popular statement to say, but I'll say it for what it's worth is, if you're not an invested member of our community and your sole purpose is to come here and cause trouble and our, destroy our community, please leave. And if it's by taking and using a hammer legislatively to get these people out of here that are gonna ruin our community, then leave, go somewhere else. Go, go find a community where that type of behavior is welcomed, but don't do it in Wisconsin Rapids. Well, I, and again, I, I agree with you 100%, Steve, but it's a case where how do we attract people to buy into our community so that we can just naturally push away people that haven't purchased into the ideology that I want to be a member, a strong, outstanding member of this community by creating services, by making sure that our roads are as good as they used to be and they're not, by providing services such as uh, leaf pickup and, and uh, brush pickup and stuff that we've been uh, not attending to in the last 10 years that we had. We're, we don't have the services that we used to and hopefully by creating the new projects that we voted for on the council floor that that will attract more people to purchase single family houses or live in multi-family residences and yeah by default push out the other stuff that isn't um, that doesn't want to invest into the community but that's the number one thing we got to create uh, and fund these services and uh, it, because otherwise if we don't if we let everything fall apart then that's when negativity comes in and when I say negativity I'm referring to the um, unvested people that are causing cloud exhaust and everything else so but it, so it isn't yeah it, there's it's multi-layer, it's like an onion. The more we pull back, the more we see. We could go back and talk about the state of nature with Thomas Hobbes and whatever else of you know creating a society, creating rules because of people's phantasms and different things in, in his book Leviathan. But I mean, if, if there was an easy way of doing it, I'm sure we would have already done it. We would have been, you know, rubber stamped it. But I, I just, I'm always leery about fines because there isn't just that fining apparatus. It's got to go through um, the, the um, municipal attorney, then it goes to the municipal judge, and there's uh, and also law enforcement has a little bit of discretion as well. So just because we pass a local ordinance with a higher fine doesn't mean that it's actually going to trickle down and really hit somebody, you know? I mean, it, 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 am I against um, uh, increase in fine? No. But is it is our outcome going to be that beneficial that you know we, we think it will be, or do we have to address multiple things at the same time? You know what I mean? I mean, I, like I said, I I, I don't want to denounce the, the cause on this, but it's the increasing a fine. I I just I'm always leery about. <coughs> Oh, Heather. Okay. Um, I just I wasn't sure. Um, it it kind of sounds like fines aren't really, or increasing fines aren't really an option because they're set by the state. And yada, yada. <coughs> the only one would be the um, disorderly conduct, which the city controls. But as far as talking about a deter deterrent, um, would it, I guess, would it be possible to? maybe go a different route other than making it like a, a police issue, making it more of a citizen issue, 
there's like the C click fix thing of maybe having some something on the website or something where where the citizens could maybe do some reporting just to kind of help out the police in, in situations like this. I mean, we're speaking of, or I'm speaking directly of, of our street. Um, we live on that hill and the stop sign on Apricot there, eh, no one stops. <laughs> no one stops and I've almost gotten T-boned several times. I mean, our kids walk <coughs> to school and, and we're afraid to let them walk to school because, you know, of, of what's gonna happen. Um, and just, I guess, if there's, there, if we can set up those deterrents um, through through citizen reporting, I don't know, um, in certain areas, if, um, I don't even know what they're called, but they, they have those, the like the speed traps set up where they have the, um, radar the visual, yeah, <laughs> thank you, the radar the camera on that um, I don't know I think it's camera some of those are the yeah, radar ours aren't. Our, ours aren't. Okay. Oh, our, yeah I don't I don't know but I mean something along those lines I mean to I don't know to get some results chief can I speak for just a minute just yeah, a, absolutely. Uh, I think all three of you at one point or another have, have gotten a hold of me one-on-one -on -one with a particular issue that you've had in your in your area and you know we've addressed that you had a guy on your street that was speeding around like crazy um, I can make a suggestion these are all quality of life issues and quality of life issues are hugely important to people who live in these neighborhoods and we understand that um, I want to make sure that we're addressing these so a suggestion I could make to all the aldermen you all hear from folks that live in your in your areas um, if you come up with some kind of way to forward those complaints to me on a regular basis, then we could almost hand them out to the beat officers that are, you know, the guy on Second Avenue with the black truck that's speeding, he's doing it again, go knock on his door. Those kind of things, community policing. Um, so if I could suggest that when you guys do hear from, from your constituents, that get it to me or to Brian, the deputy chief, on, uh, you know, right away, and we'll, we'll take care of it. I mean, other things is we can, you know, we can flood an area for a day or two and write a whole bunch of tickets and get the word out. I mean, those are things that we've done in the past. If it's a problem area, we know about it. Uh, stop sign an apricot. If a, if a person in the neighborhood's complaining about that, then let's flood it for, uh, again, you guys have seen how many tickets the guys are writing there. It's just, yeah, you can't have a squad car at every intersection of town in 24 hours a day. It just doesn't happen that way. You know, I've had people cut me off but look, I can flip on my lights and be like, yeah, surprise, I'm the police. But uh, we all can't do that. But you can let us know about it so we can do something. That's all we're asking is that, we're, like I said, we're not everywhere all the time, but you know, citizens, if they get a hold of us, then, you know, please let us know where the problem areas are. And I, I think that that's big too because we were just dealing with some recently. That's the number one thing that I, I, I say I'll take your concern into uh, consideration. I'll go through the proper channels. But please, as a resident, if there's a chronic issue, let law enforcement know. Or no, I mean, it, 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 but it's, I think it's almost more powerful if the resident well, themselves, right? Because then they can create a record. Uh, and then if it becomes a nuisance, and that's one thing that I've been working with too, uh, with the chief and, and, and the PD, is a, a nuisance issue if a police report is filed within X amount of three of them or four of them or what, I, I don't want to comment. Actually, the nuisance is actually enforcement actions rather than reports, okay. just so we're clear. And if it was a case where they were able to write a ticket, then that's where these come from. But uh, so many people don't, they, they have relayed to me, they're like, oh, we don't, we don't want to call the police because we don't want to get a bad name. You're not going to get a bad name. And that advocacy, I think that's the biggest thing. That's the easiest thing. That's the free thing that we can be doing is advocating to our constituents says hey law enforcement's our friend you know they're not you just because you keep on calling doesn't mean that you're going to be the bad guy sure, I think you're saying it better than I did but they talk to you more than they talk to us correct and, and just reaching out the police uh, uh, and I think the chief is uh, you know excited to be able to say well, our, our constituents aren't the bad guys the constituents need to help the police get the bad guys you know and that again it's free it doesn't cost anything, you know, and that ensures that tickets are being written, regardless of what the, the fine is. They're at, they got to get the ticket written first before the fine can impact them, you know. So 
but not, I'm sorry, not to, not to change the subject on this, but that's one, one avenue that I think is underutilized. No, and I, I, out of this, if the only thing we can really do is contact the municipal judge and ask him to review, to yeah. review it, I would at least like out of this committee to see us contact the municipal judge. I, if the only thing we can touch out of these three is a disorderly council for the middle board vehicle. I think it's at least we're worth doing that. Um, it, you know, for people that are out there doing stuff with their vehicles that they shouldn't be doing, it gives the police department another tool that they can use. If you know, if we can make it a thousand dollar fine on disorderly conduct with a motor vehicle, if that one, just like with the trucks, if the word gets out that behavior is not going to be tolerated in Wisconsin Rapids, if it does something to even make a dent in it, I think it's worth it. Everybody keeps on talking about a black truck, so I got to get a tip. <laughs> 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 but, so I'll make I'll make a motion to have it referred to the municipal judge. But one quick thing that Sue pointed out about the reason why we almost kind of keep that uh, disorderly conduct with motor vehicle at a certain level is because it's a negotiation tool because there's no points with it. If someone gets a speeding ticket, they're gonna lose three points, the insurance company is gonna get notified about it. But the is it the city of Rosendale or the village of Rosendale? They're an incorporated entity that they're an official speed trap and everybody knows. And what they do is they'll write you a speeding ticket that's like 9850 or whatever's in their docket or whatever if, if, if they've got a different one than what state is. But then you call and you call the city of, um, district attorney or whatever and, and they they say well you know we you know you were clocked but here our our municipal um, disorderly conduct is two hundred and sixteen dollars but it's not going to affect your insurance and you say it's going to cost me a hundred bucks more but then no one's going to know about it you write the check it goes into their coffer and, and guess what they pay for a new squad car every year from it so it sounds like Cicero or something. So, and yeah, do a Google search for Rosendale. They sell t-shirts at the gas station on Highway 26. <laughs> I went through Rosendale and got a speeding ticket. Okay. So, um, but that's, that's what, there's a leverage aspect with that disorderly conduct at the municipal level. So whether we would want to increase it to or identify maybe another option with that. But yeah, I, long story short, I wouldn't have a problem, I, and I'll actually make that motion. I make a motion to send this particular item for review with the municipal judge. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second to refer reviewing the fine amount for disorderly conduct of the motor vehicle to the municipal court judge. All right, every, um, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carried. Thank you, sir. Um, the last item on our agenda, well, second to last, consider amending the number of items needed to trigger a legislative committee meeting. I think we've talked about a number like three or four. I'm not, I myself particularly think that it should be, oh, good. I think it honestly should be uh, the chairman's decision as to when to have it because you might not have those three or four items that you need to trigger a legislative committee meeting, but you might get one item that's really pressing that you need to deal with. So, um, as a chairman of a committee, you're, you're in contact with the city clerk and the city attorney and the other enti entities in there, and I think you, know, you, can, you can gauge how important the item is. So I, I, I really, in my opinion, think it's due to the chairman's decision. How about this? Just for spitballing, what if we created uh, and uh, uh, established it as a standing committee? And if we didn't have anything, we just don't have a meeting. But if we had even one thing, we would have it as uh, a committee meeting, a regular schedule of committee meeting, much like um, the other three standing committees, and then have it on council automatically. And then we would actually be voting on it instead of having like a referral of this to go to another committee or committee of the whole or whatever else. Technically, is it just a standing yeah. committee already? Right, this is a standing committee. It is committee. a standing committee? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Right. But I do. But it is, but it is, but right, but, but I think the point you're making is that it's, it's a, just like the other ones, it's every month, and then I guess if you need to cancel one, you cancel, but this keep getting it on the calendar versus just whenever you might need it. Yeah, I agree, and I think even if we have one item, it, let's dispose of it and take care of it. Uh, yeah. And uh, 
move on instead of waiting for a list of things. I don't have a problem with that, so I'll make a motion to what do we have, what do we want to make a motion to um, to have a monthly legislative committee meeting. If there's items, because but it, yeah, if there isn't an item, then we wouldn't yeah. have it. We wouldn't send out an agenda with no right items on there. So yeah, I'd have it have it regularly scheduled. If even one item mm -hmm. is up for discussion or you know uh, uh, consideration, so um, yeah, maybe the motion would be I, I make a motion to um, regularly schedule the legislative committee meeting. If there is any um, items we're discussing, I'll second that. Did you catch that motion? Or I did. I'm looking on the bottom nice. of my page here. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion and a second to hold a regularly scheduled legislative committee meeting monthly if we have items that need to be disposed of. Good. Yes. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Final item is adjournment. I'll so we have a motion second. and a second. Motion by that, second by Steve to adjourn at 7.13 p.m. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Meeting adjourned.